You guys have muted your camera, I think. I can't hear anything. We are not yet started, sir. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on radiology and investigations for joint disorders. I thank our administrator, Reverend Father Roshan Krasta, Father Muller Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital, Principal Dr. ESJ Prabhukiran, and Vice Principal Dr. Wilma Dizosa, Father Muller Homeopathic Medical College, for providing an opportunity to conduct this webinar. On account of World Arthritis Day 2020, the Department of Sir of Father Muller Homeopathic Medical College are jointly organizing a continuing education activity conjoint. We have with us our resource person, Dr. Vivian Roshan Almeida, MBBS, MS Ortho, MRCS, MRCPS, Associate Professor, Department of Orthopedics, Father Muller Medical College. Dr. Vivian is an orthopedic surgeon specialized in joint replacement and arthroscopic keyhole surgeries. His expertise mainly involves hip and knee replacement surgeries, ligament injuries, and fracture fixation. He performs a wide array of procedures which are patient-specific with personalized patient care. Regarding his achievements, he secured the fifth rank in the MS Orthopedic University examination conducted by RGHS in 2009, secured MRCS from the Royal College of Surgeons, Ireland in December 2010, and was awarded the MRCPS by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Glasgow, in 2011. He finished a fellowship in knee surgery, sports medicine, and arthroplasty from Inje University, Seoul, South Korea, and also was awarded the SG Gopal Krishna Fellowship by the Indian Arthroscopic Society. He completed a clinical rotation in sports medicine from Hospital for Joint Diseases, New York University, USA. He was selected as a faculty in the second Karnataka Arthroscopic Society Conference held in 2015 and nominated as the Joint Secretary of the Canada Orthopedic Society for the term 2015 and 16. He has authored and co-authored various articles in index journals of high impact factor and also gives live TV interviews on social media. With these few words, I invite Dr. Vivian Roshan Almeida to begin his presentation. Over to you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. John, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, see, the thing is, uh, the topic that has been given to me is uh, how to diagnose the various arthritic conditions that affect our joints. Now, obviously, there is a difference in the way the allopathic doctors and you guys, the homeopathic doctors, how you deal with regards to the treatment, medical treatment of this, these particular conditions. But what I would like to touch upon is how to diagnose so that, you know, we don't obviously even, even in your system of medicine, I'm sure that there is a difference between treating an inflammatory kind of a disorder, a degenerative kind of a disorder or an infective kind of a disorder of the joint, isn't it? So it is very crucial for us to pick up exactly as to how to differentiate between these disorders so that we don't uh, make make a mistake in the diagnosis because even if we treat a disorder in a right manner with a wrong diagnosis, ultimately it leads to a catastrophic result. So it is very important to actually differentiate between these disorders. 
in addition to that i would also like to give a small keynote about what are the surgical aspects for these particular disorders because once i'm sure even you guys would agree that once uh, a a joint is damaged to the extent where it is irreversible then any medicine for that matter be it allopathy homeopathy or ayurveda wouldn't help much then that is when we consider surgery so uh, can we start are the participants already logged in okay so the first thing that i would like to touch upon is what do you mean by arthritis okay so normally when we when we do speak to the lay people like when i speak to my patients they keep confusing between arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis okay so arthritis doesn't mean a particular form of a disease it is just a common word that is used for a condition where there is a damage to the articular cartilage of a synovial joint resulting in the pain and the loss of a function so that arthritis can be because of degeneration it can be because of an infection it can be because of an inflammation or it can be secondary to a traumatic injury as well so arthritis when we talk about arthritis it doesn't mean i'm sure that you would have seen all these crooked fingers in deformed lower limbs so it doesn't mean that it's only that form of arthritis arthritis just means that there is a damage of the joint now if we if we dwell into the anatomy of a synovial joint what do you mean by synovial joint basically what do you mean by joint to begin with so joint is basically a com- in simple terms if i were to explain a connection or a communication between two bones okay when this joint we have different type of joints in the body now when this joint is covered by a membrane or covered by a covering known as a synovial membrane then such a joint is called as a synovial joint now these bones they have got a covering known as an articular cartilage now this cartilage has got multiple constituents i am not going going to go into the detail of that now why is it important to know this is the the principal point is that this articular cartilage does not have nerve endings that is what we need to know so whenever and how do we realize that there is some pain in some part of the body it is because of of the nerves the nerve carries an impulse from that part of our body to our master computer that is our brain and tells that okay there is pain there so when there are no no nerve endings there is no question of a pain arising so for example even if a person is awake and i take a small scalpel scalpel blade and i scratch on the articular cartilage a person would not actually realize the pain because there are no nerve endings but due to various causes that is either because of an age or because of an infection or something like that when this articular cartilage gets damaged what does happen is the bone that is present beneath the articular cartilage gets exposed and when these bone surfaces rub against each other which have nerve endings that is when a person develops pain and such a condition is known as arthritis now coming to the classification now what are the various type of arthritis that we know in my introduction i already told you that arthritis just doesn't mean rheumatism it just doesn't mean osteoarthrosis it has got several reasons or there are different types of arthritis now the most common arthritis that we do see is what is known as degenerative arthritis okay that means a wear and tear arthritis now here it is a misnomer arthritis because by definition a degenerative damage to the joint is not an inflammatory damage so we don't call it as arthritis we call it as arthrosis so it is called as osteoarthritis osteoarthrosis now if there is an infection of the joint which results in the damage of a joint such a such a condition is known as an infective arthritis it can be because of septic arthritis where the pyogenic organisms are responsible or when a tubercular organism is responsible we call it as tubercular arthritis then we have traumatic uh, traumatic form of arthritis where we can have intraarticular fractures or arthritis secondary to ligament injuries or osteochondral injuries where the cartilage gets damaged then we have crystalline form of arthritis where there is a deposition of when when the deposition is monosodium urate monohydrate we call it as gouty arthritis or when there is a deposition of cppd that is calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate then it is called as pseudo gout we also have other forms of crystalline arthritis like ochronosis okay where there is a a, a deposition of a homogenetic acid okay so then certain conditions which result in coagulation defects that means when the bleeding doesn't stop when there is excess bleeding into the joint that kind of an arthritis is known as hemophilic arthritis and finally we have the second most common type that is inflammatory that is rheumatoid arthritis and the associated disorders now it is very important for us to know all these conditions 
so that we keep it in our mind the differential diagnosis when a person now when a patient comes to you approaches you with pain of a particular joint we need to differentiate between these type of arthritis now only if we are aware of what are the conditions that can cause this particular problem then only we'll be able to uh, arrive at a diagnosis now the first point degenerative arthritis so there are certain as you see i'm not going to the theoretical aspects i'm just going to talk about the clinical aspects these are certain key points that you can keep in your mind uh, when diagnosing the different type of arthritis so degenerative arthritis or degenerative arthrosis osteoarthrosis are of two types that is it can be primary or secondary primary is usually in, seen in elderly people and it is more commonly seen in the weight bearing joints that is the knees the hips and the first carpo metacarpal joint of the hand now it doesn't mean that it cannot occur in the other joints but these are the common joints that are involved secondary is because of an underlying cause now what happens here as i told you already there is a damage to the articular cartilage the nerve endings get exposed because the subchondral bone that is the bone that is present beneath the cartilage which has nerve endings get exposed and when they rub against each other the person develops pain now what are the investigations that you do to diagnose a degenerative arthritis so the first thing that you do is you ask for an x ray now uh, the uh, a key clinical point to diagnose a degenerative arthritis is degenerative arthritis the pain is usually associated with activity and relieved by rest this is one crucial point that you need to remember of course even in advanced degenerative arthritis a person can develop the pain without activity that is called as night pain that is seen in advanced arthritis advanced degenerative arthritis but usually in the mild to moderate form the pain is usually associated with weight bearing and relieved with rest so what are the investigations that we do ask so x ray which is a weight bearing x ray which is very important now uh, these are the theoretical aspects i'll also put a few x ray pictures so that you guys can pick it up okay now what do we notice here is there is a decrease in the joint space now whenever we we see a normal knee or a hip x ray there is a gap that is seen on the x ray between two bone surfaces okay now this gap is filled with the cartilage the cartilage cannot be seen on the x ray that is the reason it looks translucent okay or it looks transparent now when this gap reduces that means when the cartilage reduces in size and when the two bones start rubbing against each other there is a decrease in the joint space which gives an indirect indication that the cartilage is worn off now based on that we decide when to operate or whether you know medicines will help or any other forms of treatment options are there the second thing is obviously on the x ray you can see a deformity then there is something called as the subchondral sclerosis that means the bone that is present where the two bones are kissing against each other it appears to be more white or more radio opaque when compared to the rest of the bone then there is something known as osteophytes i will i will subsequently come to the pictures as well the pictorial representation but these are the things that you need to remember and then you can have what are known as cysts as well okay an mri obviously is essential to rule out the soft tissue status that means we need to know how the ligaments are how the menisci are and how the what are known as the collateral ligaments are because these things are very important when we take a decision about a replacement surgery now coming to the treatment i am not going to go into the medical aspect of the treatment because obviously there is a uh, significant difference upon what you guys do and what we do so let us skip that particular thing now if the medical aspect doesn't help okay medical aspect be it homeopathy or allopathy doesn't help because once there is a complete say if the if the damage is beyond a moderate phase when the medical aspect does not help then we go to the next level of treatment what are the options that are there now the uh, if a person does not improve with medical treatment and physiotherapy the next thing that i usually give the patients is an option of an injection into the knee joint okay this can be in the form of a visco supplementation what is known as a sodium hyaluronic acid this is basically an artificial replacement for the synovial fluid that is naturally present in the joint it basically acts as a lubricant it is like basically applying some grease to a machine so that the machine works well in addition to that there are newer injections known as prp injections which stand for platelet rich plasma where if the damage of the cartilage is mild to moderate and we give an injection this particular con constituent has got regenerating potential that means it helps in the regeneration of the cartilage to a certain extent now say this also fails what next next is obviously we go ahead with the surgical aspects that is we can either do a keyhole surgery with the joint debridement which does give the patient a temporary pain relief uh, the advantage of this procedure is that it is 
a minor procedure does not involve a, a longer period of rehabilitation and the person the patient is usually back to normal within 2 or 3 days following surgery the disadvantage is being it can only be used for moderate amount when when there is complete damage to the joint there is no point in doing an arthroscopy and the second thing is again it's a temporary procedure where you can buy about 6 months to a year for the patient now the other two principal surgeries are what are known as the osteotomy surgeries or the replacement surgeries osteotomy is a surgery where we cut the bone and we realign the bone so that we shift the weight bearing axis of a particular joint so that we what do we do now whenever there is a wear and tear of a joint one part of the joint will be damaged and the other part of the joint, joint does not get damaged okay i'm talking about a degenerative arthritis now there what do we do by cutting the bone and realigning the structure of the bone we shift the weight bearing axis to a relatively normal portion of the bone so that the patient has relief and finally we uh, we talk about the replacement surgeries that is a total knee replacement or a total hip replacement i'm sure you are aware of that next we come to the infective arthritis now here when you diagnose an infective arthritis it is very important for you to differentiate between a septic arthritis and a tubercular arthritis okay because again the treatment in our medicine our system of medicine is very different the antibiotics are different the anti tubercular drugs are totally different and why is it important it is it is very important from the surgical point of view also because if you know about a total knee replacement one of the absolute contraindications for a total knee replacement is an infection now the only exception to this rule is tubercular infection where under the coverage of an anti tubercular treatment for 3 months we can still go ahead with a replacement okay now the clinical features now clinical features uh, now it is very important to differentiate between an infective arthritis and the other form of arthritis because this is one of the orthopedic emergencies when there is a pus inside the joint uh, i mean to be very frank i don't know how your system of medicine works with regards to this particular thing but in our system of medicine when there is pus inside the joint there is no question of antibiotic there is no question of any medicine it has to be drained it is one of the few orthopedic absolute emergencies okay once you drain the pus out then you can go to the medical aspect so that there is no reformation of the pus the pus is dead tissue for any medicine to reach any part of the body blood circulation is important when there is no blood reaching the pus there is no question of giving any medicines because it doesn't reach the pus so the pus has to be evacuated and then you do whatever medical aspects that are required now subsequently now what happens if we intervene late or we don't intervene at all then what happens is the person usually ends up with deformities in tubercular infections or something known as ankylosis ankylosis is where the two bones come in contact with each other they join together they fuse and there is no movement or if we intervene reasonably well but a little late when the cartilage is already damaged then you end up with a secondary osteoarthritis uh, osteoarthrosis now clinical features i told you the patient will be toxic and it is an extremely painful condition okay so uh, if a person has septic arthritis that particular person will not be able to move an inch as well okay there is a gross restriction of movement whereas in the case of osteoarthritis or other form of arthritis the patient will have pain but still the person will be able to move the limb a little bit and as i told you it's an orthopedic emergency now what are the investigations how do you diagnose a septic arthritis or an infective arthritis so we do we need to do now x ray and radiology is a part of it but blood parameters are very very important so we do blood tests where we do a total count which shows a gross elevation usually above the level of 11500 12000 differential count which will show a predominance of neutrophils esr is grossly elevated usually above the range of 80 crp is grossly positive which is above the range of usually 25 30 and procalcitonin which is another inflammatory marker now sometimes in case of an inf inflammation as well these markers may be slightly elevated though not in the range that i just mentioned but before we open a joint we need to confirm that it is an infection now in addition to the radiology and the um, uh, imaging modalities the principal thing to diagnose an infection inside the joint is what is known as synovial fluid analysis so what do we do under aseptic precautions we aspirate the pus from the joint wherever it's located and we send it for various tests we send it for gram staining we send it for total count we send it for i will subsequently come there's a flow chart there as to how how you need to diagnose that and then there are newer investigation modalities that are there what are known as gene expert and the pcr which are highly sensitive this is more com this is used for tubercular infection 
Now, as I told you, we need to differentiate between both the five, uh, both the types of infection because clinically both may look very similar. And finally, the gold standard is the biopsy, which can be done from an arthroscopic point of view or an open open procedure. Traumatic. Again, we do X-rays, MRI scans. So it can be in the form of intraarticular fractures, ligament injuries, like meniscal injuries, ACL injuries, collateral ligament injuries, or osteochondral injuries. Crystalline arthropathy. Here, uh, this is basically we diagnose using blood tests, where uh, serum uric acid is elevated in, in case if it's, uh, it's gout. In an acute gouty arthritis, you, the ESR and the CRP is grossly elevated again, and the total count appears to be normal. So this, an acute gouty arthritis can and always mimic septic arthritis. So it is very important for us to differentiate between a crystalline arthropathy as well as an infective arthropathy. Okay? Because the ESR, CRP is grossly elevated in both. It is extremely painful. The joint will be warm. The joint will be reddened. So we may confuse and treat one for the other. But here the total count is usually reasonably normal. And again, the synovial fluid analysis is a clincher to differentiate between both the types of arthritis. In synovial fluid an analysis, what we do in addition to the regular tests, in crystalline arthropathy, we send it for what is known as Polaroid microscopy, where a negatively birefringent crystals can be seen in case of gout and a positively birefringent crystals can be seen in case of pseudogout. Again, biopsy is the gold standard. Coagulation defects, that is hemophilia. Obviously, we need to do blood parameters like PT, INR, APTT and factor eight assay. Inflammatory, the other most common, commonly seen uh, arthritis, the, in, in our clinical practice. Now, what are the tests that we do ask for an inflammatory arthritis? So, we do a rheumatoid factor and an anti streptolysin O titer, CRP, which is obviously now uh, a common misconception is RA positive means rheumatoid arthritis, RA negative means not rheumatoid arthritis. It doesn't work that way. Okay. RA positive indicates that it is a zero positive rheumatoid arthritis, RA negative indicates that it is a zero negative rheumatoid arthritis. So we diagnose rheumatoid arthritis based on certain criteria of which rheumatoid arthritis also is a part, RA factor. So clinical features are important. X-ray features are important. Clinic, when we talk about clinical features, small joint involvement, bilateral symmetrical involvement, early morning stiffness for more than an hour. So there are criteria to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. So why is it important to differentiate between zero positive and zero negative? In the English system of medicine or the allopathic system of medicine, zero positive rheumatoid arthritis requires the much stronger Anti DMARD, that is disease modifying anti rheumatoid drugs. Now, why can't you can ask a question saying that why can't we start that straight away? Now, these all these drugs are filled with a lot of side effects. Okay, so we need to start on these medications only if it is justifiable. So, if it is a zero negative rheumatoid arthritis in our system of medicine, what we usually do is we start with a milder form which have got lesser amount of side effects. When it's zero positive, we usually strong, start with a stronger form of drugs. So, total count differential count again will be elevated. ESR. ESR is grossly elevated in an active rheumatoid disease in the range of more than 100. Anti-CCP. This is a recent sensitive and specific test when compared, compared to the rheumatoid factor that we do. What is known as an anti-CCP. It is again a blood test. Now say the person has got arthritis in inflammatory features of inflammatory arthritis, but the rheumatoid factor is negative. All the other tests are negative. Then what do we do? We are confused. So we go with what is known as an ANA profile or an anti-nuclear antibody profile. Now, this helps us to diagnose the other form of inflammatory diseases like SLE uh, or scleroderma, pyomyositis. There are, there are various rarer form of inflammatory arthritis as well, which is important to be diagnosed because, again, the, treat of, treatment, is, uh, the treatment line is slightly different. And the last we do what is known as the HLA-B27, which can be positive in certain seronegative arthritis like psoriatic arthritis or uh, ankylosing spondylitis or arthritis with inflammatory bowel disease. Rita syndrome. So there are multiple conditions like this. Okay. Now this is what you need to concentrate on. Okay. So how do we diagnose? So the first thing is a complete history and physical examination is very important. Okay. So if there's history of trauma or a focal bone pain, then we do usually the x-rays and we diagnose an osteoarthritis or if fracture or revulsion is there, then obviously we need to refer, refer such patients. Okay. Now if there is Osteoarthritis, next thing that we do is to go ahead with the blood investigations, the things that I told you, a complete blood count, that is a TCD, CSR and all those things, and CRP as well, and a uric acid level. Now, if it is a joint inflammation, the, if there is a gross effusion of the joint, that means if there is gross swelling of the joint, where there is a lot of fluid in the joint, we go ahead with what is known as arthrocentesis. Arthrocentesis means aspiration of the fluid within the joint. 
Now, there we diagnose based upon the... Now, if the total count is grossly elevated, okay, it's grossly elevated, that if it is more than 1 lakh per millimeter cube, then of the of the of the fluid, then it is a sure short septic arthritis. Okay, if it is less in the range of two thousand to ten thousand, then it is usually a inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis or gout or whatever it is. If it is bloody, it can be in the form of hemophilia or it can be because of an occult fracture. Okay, and if there are crystals, obviously we diagnose gouty arthritis. Okay, now before I go to the X-rays. Uh, Dr. John, how do I know if the the audience has got any questions? You know, before I go to the uh, X-ray pictures, I I would like to know if if people have understood what I have spoken so far, or if there are any doubts. Till now there are no questions. We can okay. Proceed. And we'll collect all the questions at the end, and then we can okay. discuss it. Sir. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, have I been clear so far? Ah, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we come to the X-rays. Now this is an X-ray of the hip joint. Okay, if you see on the left-hand side of your screen, I don't know if it is inverted. Is it inverted? The green, the green lines are on the left-hand side of the picture or the right-hand side? Uh, Doctor John. Ah, uh, sir. The green, the green lines are uh -huh. on the left-hand side of the picture or the right-hand side picture. Uh, left hand side of the picture. Left hand, okay. So it's not laterally inverted. Okay. So now here it is very important that you differentiate. Now, can you see the two green lines? Now, those two green lines are almost parallel to each other, and there is a gap between those two lines. Now, that is what is filled by a by the cartilage. Now, if you see the picture on the right hand side, if you really see, you see the ball of the femoral head and the acetabulum. There is absolutely no gap. There is absolutely no gap. Can you can you see that? Now, that is an indication of a degenerative arthritis. Or an arthritic condition, okay. So this is an X-ray of a hip. So that is what the first thing that you need to see is whether there is any gap between both the bones. Now this is very uh, now hip. The hip X-rays are a little complicated. You need to train your eyes by seeing a lot of X-rays to diagnose a, a hip arthritis. But the knee is a relatively simple joint. A relatively simple joint. Now on the left hand side picture. Now see on the right hand side picture. So there is a femur and there is a tibia. Now these two bones have got a gap between each other, isn't it? So that is what is filled by the cartilage. So a normal knee X-ray looks like how it is there, how it is on the right hand side. But see on the left hand side. On the left hand side, you can see that the medial aspect of the femur and the tibia are completely coming in contact with each other. There is no gap between these two bones. Now that gives an indirect indication that the cartilage is completely worn off, and the 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 raw bony surfaces are touching against each other, resulting in severe arthritic pain. Now, in addition to that, to diagnose uh, osteoarthritis, it is important to differentiate between osteoarthritis on an X-ray and, say, an inflammatory arthritis. I'll show you the pictures of an inflammatory arthritis also how, as to how they look. So, if you see at the edges of the bone, there is something like a an overgrowth that is to the left-hand side of the white arrow mark. Can you see a small bump-like thing there? which is not there on a normal x-ray. If you see on the normal x-ray, that cannot be seen. Now, they are what are known as marginal osteophytes. If, I, if you go into the theoretical aspect that I told you, marginal osteophytes, subchondral sclerosis, cysts, decreased joint space are features of osteoarthritis. Now, that is not there on the normal x-ray. Now, this is the other clincher to diagnose that this is a degenerative arthritis. Now, next, you come to the the other common joint, that is carpometacarpal joint. This is again an osteoarthritis of the first joint, where you can see, I've marked a circle. So the first metacarpal and the trapezoid bone, the, the gap between this, these two bones is completely worn off. In addition to that, if you see really at the edge, at the base of the first metacarpal, you can actually see a small bony overgrowth. You know, that is what you mean by an osteophyte. Okay, so this is how you diagnose a degenerative arthritis. Now, next, you come to the inflammatory arthritis. Now, how do you differentiate between the inflammatory arthritis? Now, if you see the left-hand side of the picture, the first important differentiating feature between a degenerative arthritis and a inflammatory arthritis is, an, is a degenerative arthritis. The, there, is no, there is no osteopenia around the joint, what is known as juxta-articular osteopenia or periarticular osteopenia. There is no osteopenia around the joint. That means the bone doesn't appear to be weakened around the joint in a degenerative arthritis. 
whereas in an inflammatory arthritis that is the crucial clincher that is the bones that are surrounding the joint is severely osteopenic or weakened resulting in what giving uh, giving a picture of what is known as periarticular or juxta articular osteopenia on the right hand side you can see a rheumatoid hand which is the multiple deformities again if you see uh, for you guys to realize whether there is osteopenia or no it is very important that you see repeated normal x rays then only your eyes will be trained to pick up what is how does a normal bone look like and how does an osteopenic or a weakened bone looks like now for me since i have been practicing orthopedics for the past see 11 years after my post graduation 3 years of post graduation when i see an x ray obviously i am able to pick up whether something is weakened or no so that is an important thing because that is the most important differentiating feature between an x ray of a degenerative arthritis from an inflammatory arthritis now the other important thing is now of all the arthritis inflammatory arthritis rheumatoid does involve the cervical spine it is very important for you to pick this up whenever a patient with rheumatoid arthritis does come to me and if the patient has reached a stage where he requires a knee replacement the first thing that you need to do is to get a spine x ray as well now why because this is the only form of arthritis where you have a an involvement of the cervical spine okay now the first two bones are known as the atlas and the axis isn't it so the joint between those two are known as the atlanto axial joint now in rheumatoid arthritis because of the damage to the joint what does happen is there is a dislocation of this joint it is no this is very important for you to pick this up because if you are planning for a surgery obviously we need to give anesthesia so if you intubate a person without knowing this that can lead to catastrophic results so it is very important for a person for a clinician to ask for the x ray of the cervical spine as well when the person is, is suspecting rheumatoid arthritis now this is a classical picture of a hemophilic arthritis now here you can see if you see the intercondylar notch okay so there are two important features in a hemophilic arthritis the first thing is the widening of the intercondylar notch now if you see in the see here if you see the intercondylar notch there is no widening can you see that so but here there is a gross widening of the intercondylar notch now this is very classical of an x ray of a hemophilic arthritis okay and apart from that there is squaring of the patella that means patella which is normally round in shape appears to be squarish now the last x ray that i would like to pick, uh, to show it to you is the gouty arthritis this is the crystalline arthritis now gout by definition involves the first metatarsal joint more commonly seen in males so there is a gross destruction of the joint which is classically not seen in the case of a degenerative or inflammatory arthritis okay so you can see here in addition to that you can see a whitish structure in the soft tissue plane which are what are known as toe five that means deposition of the uh, of of these crystals okay so this is a very classical picture of a gouty arthritis now if you know now in a nutshell what you need to know is now how do you differentiate between an inflammatory degenerative and an infective arthritis so first thing is you see that if there is a decrease in the joint space with no destruction of the joint with no osteopenia with subchondral sclerosis it is degenerative decrease in the joint space with osteopenia that means weakened bones no osteophytes then it is an inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis now other things there are classical now, if it's hemophilic arthritis obviously you have a widening of the intercondylar notch squaring of the patella that is very classical there is no confusion there okay so this is very important so x rays and investigations blood investigations are very important for us to differentiate between these two conditions because the treatment line is totally different so is say we give a wonderful treatment of osteoarthritis to a rheumatoid patient obviously he is never going to benefit so that is the reason it is very important for us to uh, amalgamate clinical ex examination blood test and x ray or radiological investigation to finally arrive at a diagnosis now i was given to believe that this is this is basically for the students so i tried to keep it as simple as possible uh, i could have gone much higher than this and i could have given a lot of information finally i don't think it would assimilate in 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 their mind so it is very important for them to rather know 10 points than me giving 100 points and them not knowing anything so if you understand these things these three things so what you have to differentiate is whether it degenerative inflammatory infective severe pain fever not able to move the joint synovial fluid shows high amount a large number of wbcs it is infective pain is there on weight bearing relieved on rest 
movement is there though painful elderly patient it is degenerative pain that is present patient is able to move pain is present even at rest swelling is there then it is inflammatory so these things are what you need to keep it in mind so i would like to take this opportunity to thank dr john and his team for giving me this opportunity uh, and i'm i would be more than happy and glad if there are any doubts from your side to answer them there are some two or three questions here okay the first one from a student has asked uh, tc uh, doesn't significantly increase in gouty arthritis uh, can you explain it once again that is what she wanted uh, see uh, whenever there is an acute stress in the body okay be it in the form of an infection be it in the form of fear of surgery forget about other things okay or be it in the form of an inflammation a total count does elevate so even when there is an acute gouty arthritis see, gouty arthritis are of, is of two types so you have something known as an acute gouty arthritis or you have a chronic gouty arthritis in chronic gouty arthritis your total count will be near normal but whereas in acute gouty arthritis because of the inflammation because of the pain the total count is expected to be a little higher but when you are talking about septic arthritis it is usually in the range of 15000 plus but when you talk about inflammatory arthritis it is usually in the range of say just uh, obviously 4 to 11000 is considered to be normal it may be in the range of 10 to 12000 so that is what we need to differentiate so septic arthritis definitely above 15000 okay there is one more uh... so you can uh, uh, stop your screen share otherwise uh, 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 sorry one, one, one second sir um, yeah. one, one more question is there actually um, they wanted to know how to systematically read a knee x ray what all points to be considered so in your slide uh, on knee yeah i will just go back to that uh, see now just look at this x ray okay so on the right hand side there is a normal knee x ray okay now in a knee x ray what you need to see the first thing you need to see is the joint space okay that means the space that is present between the femur and the tibia okay the second thing that you need to see is how is the bone quality around the joint okay whether it is weakened or whether it is normal now on the right hand side you can see this is a normal quality of the bone okay now i'll show you one more picture now okay if you can see this particular thing this particular thing can i write on this i cannot write on this i think no okay now if you see this particular picture can you see around the joint the bone appears to be much lighter if you compare these two x rays you can clearly okay now look at this how it appears and look at this at, as to how it appears so that is the second point that you need to see systematically so whether there is a decrease in the joint space second is the quality of the bone third is at the edges to see for marginal osteophytes and fourth is subchondral sclerosis so you just remember these four points that's all now if there is a decrease in the joint space which is seen in all form of form arthritis and the and the quality of the bone appears to be normal and it is usually the medial compartment that is involved then it is 99% a degenerative arthritis if the if there is a decrease in the joint space the quality of the bone around the joint is poor when compared to a norm but see as i told you you need to see repeated normal x rays to know how uh, the how, how does a poor quality bone look like on the x ray okay and if there is a decrease in both the compartments that is the medial and the lateral compartment then it's usually an inflammatory arthritis so these these are three ba- three to four basic points that if you remember you can differentiate between a degenerative that means a wear and tear arthritis or an inflammatory arthritis following this question there is one more uh, how to read the uh, uh, systematic cervical uh, vertebrae in the cervical, cervical spine is it yeah. okay this is a little difficult for a first timer okay uh, see cervical spine the first thing is if you see a normal x ray uh, uh, dr john uh, like are they are they aware of technical terms like lordosis kyphosis and all that yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. they are aware they are they are aware isn't it okay so normally in a cervical spine you have what is known as a lordosis okay now if you see this x ray there is a reversal of lordosis that means there is a mild kyphosis okay 
So the cervical spine, what you see, the first thing is you see the lordosis. I'm talking about a normal cervical spine, how it looks like. Lordosis. Second thing is you see the, you draw a line along the, what is known as the anterior longitudinal ligament. That means the anterior border of the vertebra. Okay? Throughout. You draw another line along the posterior border of the vertebra. Now, those two lines need to form a smooth curve and they should be parallel to each other. Now, if they are, say, if they, they are stepped or if there is a convergence or divergence, that means that there is some movement of the vertebra which is not in normal alignment. This is the second prin principal point. Third thing that you see is the gap between two successive vertebrae. Now, if you see on this particular x-ray, one, two, three, four. If you see the gap between four and five, C4 and C5, you can see that there is a clear decrease. C5, C6 also there is a decrease. See the gap between C3 and C4. There is a significant gap. That is how a normal gap looks like. So now this decrease is another indication that there is some problem there. Now, apart from that, for you to pick up an atlantoaxial dislocation or a basilar invasion, I mean, it, it requires a lot of repeated training and seeing a lot of x-rays. It is a little difficult. But these three principal things, if you see, that is more than enough. So whether there is a, there is, what do you say, a smooth curve, gap between two successive vertebrae, and whether there is a cervical lordosis. So these three things are the basic things that you need to see in a cervical spine. Somebody has typed some question. Are calcium supplements beneficial in preventing OA and aging? How, can, how long it to be continued? Uh, no, calcium supplementation does not have any benefit when it comes to osteoarthritis. It is beneficial in osteoporosis. Now, these two are, I'm sure you are aware that these two are totally different conditions altogether. Okay? Uh, now, whenever a person comes to my clinic or in the OPD with, uh, with osteoarthritis, I do supplement calcium as well because obviously osteoarthritis is a problem that is seen in an elderly individual and an elder, especially women. I'm not talking about men. And in women, post-menopausal period, you do expect bones to weaken, what is known as post-menopausal osteoporosis. So we do give calcium supplements to them as well, but that does not principally help in osteoarthritis. It is for the treatment of the osteoporosis. Now, on a later date, if, if the arthritis is very severe and if I'm planning a knee replacement, now the knee replacement is an artificial joint that is kept on the bone. Now, no matter how fantastic a building is, if the foundation is not good, that building is going to fall. So obviously, we do give calcium supplementation there as well to strengthen the bones so that the implant that we keep on the bone has got a solid fixation. So that way, if you see indirectly, calcium supplementation is beneficial in osteoarthritis, but it does not directly protect or prevent osteoarthritis. It is used for the treatment of osteoporosis. In osteoporosis, what kind of exercise can be suggested to the patient? Now, osteoporosis per se, there is no... You are talking about osteoporosis or osteoarthritis? They have written as osteoporosis. So they have asked about osteoporosis. Sir. Porosis. Also. Okay. So there are no specific exercises for osteoporosis, but but activity. That means general physical activity like cardio exercise, walking, jogging, swimming, all these things increase the density of the bone. So activity in general is important for to prevent the osteoporosis from forming. Osteoarthritis, there are specific exercises for the joint. So suppose if a person has got knee osteoarthritis, we give specific exercises of quadriceps strengthening, hamstring strengthening. If a patient has got hip arthritis, we give abductor strengthening. If a person has got spine de degeneration, we give core muscle strengthening. So there we give specific exercises. But in osteoporosis, there is no specific exercise per se, but it is general exercise. That means walking is excellent, swimming, jogging, some kind of a sport that is apt for that particular age. So generalized activity is very important in preventing osteoporosis. But there is nothing like a specific exercise for osteoporosis. There is one more question. When there is involvement of discrete smaller joints and presented with pain and similar to presentation of degenerative disorders, what all we need to consider for further consideration? Small joints you're talking about? Uh, when there is involvement of discrete smaller joints. Okay. Now, see, smaller joints of the hand okay, or the foot, usually you don't get degenerative arthritis except the first carpometacarpal joint without a reason. Okay. Now, usually if there is degenerative arthritis in the other joint, that is usually because of an old trauma or an injury. 
it is highly unlikely maybe i would put about 5% of the cases of arthritis of the hand is because of osteoarthritis but the first first carpal metacarpal joint almost accounts for 50% of the degeneration now normally whenever there is a wear and tear or or, or arthritis of the small digits we have to think in terms of inflammatory arthritis more than the rheumatoid arthritis uh, more, more sorry more than degenerative arthritis okay so we we need to differentiate between these two so there is one more question sir uh, they wanted some uh, references for production of x ray film uh, is the question clear sir production yeah means they want to read about the x rays you mean um i can uh, think we can discuss that question and uh, we can go for the last question sir uh, what to do to prevent inflammation and uh, pain to prevent inflammation no, nobody wantedly gets inflammation it is unfortunately an autoimmune disorder okay that uh, comes without any invitation okay uh, now the thing is i do know i do know in the alternative system of medicine that is in homeopathy and ayurveda uh you do have medicines which claim that you know it reduces the inflammation of the body uh it helps in the in increasing of the immunity and things like that okay uh but in our english system of medicine we usually don't believe in any medications that prevents inflammation so once if, if inflammation does set in then we go ahead with the treatment now to prevent inflammation people do believe that there are certain dietary habits uh, i mean if people are aware of canada they say that mayannu tampu madisuvanta ahara padarthagalu and things like that so if you ask since i am an allopathic doctor i am not completely discarding that it's not possible uh, probably it is possible uh, and i'm not a authority in that as well but from our system of medicine unfortunately we don't have anything to say to prevent something from happening okay uh, i wish there was something like that then all of us could have lived for 100 years i guess okay but uh, i don't think that that is possible but uh, you can clear my doubts uh, dr john i am sure that in homeopathy you guys do have certain medications which do say that you know you reduce the inflammation in the body you reduce the uh, you know uh, uh, things like that isn't it yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. there are some uh, medicines sir. there are some medicines yeah yes, so in our system of medicines we don't we don't follow anything which are protective against inflammation so if inflammation does occur then we do uh, deal with it there are no more questions um, okay you can stop the screen share sir okay Uh, sir, sir uh, one more thing, sir. Like uh, regarding the joint replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, when we suggest a patient uh, joint replacement therapy, whether the age age factor needs to be considered. Like uh, elderly patients, uh, if you consider whether we can suggest or is there any like when they are very elderly patients, whether any any limitation for uh, joint replacement therapy. See, uh, the oldest patient I have done a joint replacement surgery is is seventy nine. Okay, the youngest I've done is thirty nine. i'm sure that there are people especially in the western countries where even up to 90 100 also there have been instances where people have done now age is one criteria it is not a hard and fast rule now how do i decide whether a person require joint replacement i mean different doctors have got these these are just guidelines there are no hard and fast rules okay what i decide is one thing is the ideal age of doing a joint replacement is 65 60 to 65 okay now there are two reasons for this okay now the artificial joint that we put it is a man made joint it is not a god given joint obviously it has a, it, it has its own life span now a well done joint replacement if the patient takes good care of it we expect it to last for about 10 to 15 years on an average 20 years if the patient is lucky so if we do at the age of 60 65 considering the normal life span of a person to be around 75 80 a person he or she lives his entire life or her entire life with that surgery now after that it subsequently loosens now a revision surgery the results are never as good as the first surgery so the first thing that we need to consider is we try to do i mean uh, operate on a person such that he or she she 
finishes finishes their life span with one surgery okay mm-hmm. now as the age progresses now you uh, but that doesn't mean that we do not do surgery for a person beyond the age of 70 i've done a lot of surgeries above 75 also but we need to consider the physiological status of the patient mm-hmm. okay i'm sure you have seen patients who are 60 who are bedridden mm-hmm. a person who is 72 is very active okay but as age progresses we are worried about other problems you know whether the person is going to recover and things like that so to do a surgery it doesn't matter whether a person is 18 70 100 the matter is the recovery so we need to individualize if a person is a is what do you say a very uh, has got an aim that he or she will do exercises he and she has got the that ability that will power to walk age is just a number i don't consider that should be considered and the other important thing when i re- decide a joint replacement is if a person has got pain when walking on a level surface as well see okay. climbing and getting down stairs i'm sure at the age of 50 you and me both of us will start having knee pain so that doesn't mean that everybody requires a surgery and we can tell things like activity modification don't climb stairs minimize climbing stairs sit towards squatting but we cannot tell a person don't walk on a level surface isn't it so when the person has got pain walking on a level surface such that he or she requires say more than 4 to 5 painkillers a week that gives okay. an indirect indication that he or she she has reached a stage of joint replacement okay. the other thing is always make sure that the symptoms and the x ray features correlate okay, okay. some people may say that the symptoms are very severe but the x ray does not show much of wear and tear never touch that patient that patient will never be happy with anything because the pain tolerance of that patient itself is horrible some people will have very bad x ray features but say no pain don't touch such a patient also because the only symptom that you can assure will significantly improve after joint replacement is pain so if the patient says he has no pain then there's no point in do- doing a joint replacement isn't it yes. so two important things symptoms and x ray should correspond level ground walking pain a fit healthy relatively healthy patient go ahead with the joint replacement nowadays they do really well okay So one more thing last one but uh, it is regarding the hemophilic arthritis actually yeah now uh, when we treat the hemophilic arthritis uh, what we need to keep in mind sir because uh, in very early childhood we are getting those there are few cases actually where we get to treat where the child comes up with a lot of uh, severe uh, swelling and uh, pain actually now in those cases what we treat for long term long term what we what expectation we can keep because uh, as uh, the acute acute condition we are trying to treat actually during the acute phase we are trying to treat actually but uh, definitely there will be some uh, affected over the affection over the cartilages will be there right because of the hemophilia or the bleeding yeah. blood actually. accumulation yeah. Yeah, yeah so in that uh, in your side your treatment what what are the other uh, better options we have sir other than uh, managing the acute symptoms see uh, unfortunately in hemophilia the idea is to basically make sure that the child doesn't bleed into the joint as much as possible okay. so you make sure that that doesn't happen to begin with okay mm-hmm. now once the child bleeds into the joint we usually what we we give ice packs and basically pain relief maneuvers that's all okay mm-hmm. now if the child is re- important thing is to replace the factor 8 okay mm-hmm. that is very important efficiency yeah. okay uh factor 8 or 9 depending upon what kind of uh, hemophilia it whether it's christmas disease or the regular classical hemophilia now if you allow the joint to uh, i mean if you allow the blood to accumulate in the joint repeatedly then definitely the joint is going to go into arthritis okay so the only thing that that is in our hand is to make sure that he or she does not bleed repeatedly into the joint there is no point in allowing that uh, bleed to occur and then uh, you know doing something about it that is like already the damage is already being done kind of a thing thanks Okay, sir. I think uh, there uh, we can end. I think we can wind up. Uh, now I will give a word of thanks, sir. Okay. okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my privilege to propose a word of thanks on this occasion. To begin with, I express my gratitude and respect to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Vivian Roshan Almeida, for sparing his valuable time in enlightening us with his expertise in the subject. Thank you, sir. I would also like to thank Dr. Ronald Menises, Professor and Head of the Department of Orthopedics, Padmula Medical College, for extending his support for organizing this webinar. I would also like to thank our administrator, Reverend Father Roshan Krascha, Principal Dr. E. S. J. Prabhu Giran, Vice Principal Dr. Vilma De Souza, and staff members for their constant support. I would also like to thank Dr. Amida Bailiga, Head of the Department of Materia Medica, for being instrumental in organizing this program. 
and my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Srinath Rao, former principal, for his valuable guidance and encouragement. I would also extend my gratitude to undergraduate and postgraduate students for their participation. Once again, thank you on and all. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, sir.